Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, hey, Bob. Hi. Hello. Um, well, I think the first thing I just want to say in general is that I think Marjorie has aged well. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Let's yeah. I, think, say that. <laughs> I think it's incredibly true because, and I, and I think even though John just um, told us a little bit about the book, I think one of the simplest things that I know about the book is that Marjorie was the first autobiographer. And then you describe yourself surprisingly to me as um, an autobiographer. Yes. <laughs> I, I, though, though I think this book for me is sort of like, I mean, A, I was surprised you, you, you used that word about yourself. Maybe you always have and I've never noticed it. But I also think that Marjorie in a certain way seems like your first active fiction. What do you think about uh, that? Uh, oh. It was a, a way to tell my story. And I, uh, I mean, insofar, when I first met Marjorie, there was a lot of recognition. Uh, there was something about her story and her kind of misplaced uh, obsession uh, that uh, intrigued me. And, also that she couldn't really understand her own experience, which I, because she didn't, she was living between, between two paradigms. All this I felt was true about myself and was a way for me to kind of express uh, a, a, a breakdown basically that I was having. Mm -hmm. So, but I use autobiography pretty loosely now I'm writing a long poem. It's about a hundred pages long now. That's just my misreadings. And it's just, you know, more or less a list of my misreadings. And that to me is also an autobiography. Um, can I just, I want to talk about this book the most, but what do you mean by misreadings? Can you tell me what you mean? Oh, I mean literal, like I read it, I pick up the newspaper in the morning or a book and I make a mistake. And then oh, I copy oh. it down. Right. So it's all my mistakes. So it's like dreaming on the page. Because they're, I mean, they're mistakes uh, that are brutally sexual sometimes or, you know, right. ruling yeah. puns. Uh, but so when I say autobiography, I, I mean, in some way, there's a kind of, Marjorie's a metaphor for me and I'm a metaphor for Marjorie in the book. And we sort of like dangle on either side of an equal sign. I mean, I think when this book came out, I think in a way it was um, it was about maybe a slightly weird um, production of yours, right? I mean, I kind of I mean, because I think <laughs> if I think about you, I I think of you as the warm avant garde,an you know, which is to uh -huh. say that your your work is sort of awkward, uncomfortable, frank, elegant, dirty, but but you're always it see, always seems to me that part of the point of your work is that you're that doing an, an experimental text is like doing a life. It's, um, it's a conventional way of letting us know about authenticity and artificiality at once. But it's always, it always seems like a warm rendering. And I feel like Marjorie, in a weird way, is your, I, I, certainly in terms of the time it came out, people, I think people knew what to expect from Bob, and you uh. kept advancing it, and I think influencing people. But, Marjorie seemed to me in, at 1994 to be your most unfriendly book, in a way. Oh, I see. Ah. I just read it for the first time since 1995. Um, I was surprised by a lot of it. Uh, uh, I'm more surprised than I thought I would be. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. When I start out writing a book, it seems to me, for all my books, and actually for everything, for writing a blurb, I, I always start from zero. And it's not, there's not an effort especially to be experimental. Uh, the effort is to record my experience mm -hmm. and try to figure out a way to do it. But Marjorie was also a romance, uh, a long-held romance with that period for me. 
uh, when when I uh, in college, I in, when I was in, in Scotland in college, I hitchhiked around looking at at Flemish Renaissance and medieval paintings. That was sort of my goal. There was always something about that period that drew me. And when I first learned about Marjorie, I, I wanted to do something. In fact, in fact, I started writing a play. I thought I would have a musical. A musical. This was in the early 70s. Uh, a musical that ended in the crucifixion. And um, I even wrote songs. Uh, let's see, I am a doctor devoid of folly. I wrote a treatise for the melancholy. So on. <laughs> it was like from 1974 or something. So I, I guess it, 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 my sense of things is that I've had Marjorie with me for a long time. And so I don't see, I don't see it as a kind of unique. She's been part of my life since I was in college. Um, yeah. But did you, did you think people received the book in the same manner as they received your other books? I mean, maybe this is a misremembering uh -huh. on my part, but I just felt like Bob threw us a weird one. Ah, uh, I see. Yes, yes. A lot of people had a hard time with it. Uh, also, I received hate mail. And... Uh, because and of its sacrilegious were, nature? Yes. And, but also, peace, people were uh, men, mostly, all all they were all men, were defending women uh, against me as though I had attacked, I made an attack. Uh, at the same time, when I was writing the book, and if I had an audience in mind, it was my women friends. Mm -hmm. And it was my women friends who responded uh, uh, most enthusiastically to the book. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you could say Jack the Modernist was a valentine to the gay male community. Marjorie Kemp was something else. And Marjorie, Marjorie is kind of trans at this moment, too. Yes. I, I, when I was reading it, I thought, wow, this gender is going in every direction, which was very true of the period. Uh, even Jesus was, you know, manifestations of Jesus with Jesus, the mother. Uh, gender was more fluid, I think, uh, than it got to be. You mean historically in that time? Yes. Yes. Right. And you, and you, I mean, I think the incredible thing that you did in making the book that I think had become sort of legend is that you, that you, I mean, I think um, Cullum described it in the introduction, and I think he was taking from Kevin and Doty's anthology that you crowd, like you crowdsourced your friends, literally, and yes. asked them how they felt about their bodies. I asked them for observations. I asked them for five observations about their bodies. Uh, first, I asked just my women friends mm -hmm. because I felt I had to be doing some research. Right. And men don't really know anything about women's bodies, and which I also discovered. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I, I, I asked women friends to help me. I also read a lot of lesbian pornography and I don't know, I tried in other ways to sort of find out, uh, to learn mm -hmm. about the subject. And um, then I thought, well, I can't, I, I can't just have uh, women's observations. So then I asked 20 of my male friends mm -hmm. to do the same. And I wanted to create a kind of, a, oh, like a community of uproar, a physical uproar. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm missing that word. A community of which? Of what? A physical uproar. Uproar, yes. Yes. That was um, sort of my goal. Also to make all my friends witness to my insane obsession or an obsession that was driving me insane. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, so there were, I mean, there were different reasons to do this, but um, I... I treasure p passages when I come across them from friends. Some uh -huh. have died now, uh, and uh, they're, you know, they're like waving at me. Mm -hmm. There's a 
that Tom Gunn gave me a wonderful one. Uh, he had sex with somebody who had just had a lot of pepper, eaten a lot, huge amount of pepper. Oh, right. yes, and yes. He, he felt the pepper in his cock uh, when he was fucking the guy. Right, right, right. I remember that passage. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I think it's, 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 um, I mean, and I want, I want to go more deeply into the, I mean, what you just mentioned about, um, you were going through something around an obsession and a breakup and, and that's all completely interesting. But I just want to think a little more about, um, the manner, the manner of production, because again, it's like, I think we, you know, we have such, um, debates right now about work, you know, who it's appropriate to write about, what appropriation is okay, yes. et cetera. Yes. And it's just like, and you know, I mean, I remember when they were making the film Bound, we were all very excited about the fact that they, it was a lesbian SM movie and that they had literally gotten Susie Bright to be on the set and advise them. Uh -huh. And it, it meant that it was very real, very hot lesbian sex. But still today, you know, we'll see like a show that I like watching Billions did the typical Hollywood thing of going into the art world. Suddenly there was a character who was a straight male artist and it just went dumb. It just was so crazy because it was so obvious that the writers thought they knew what it was to be an artist. Yes. Or at least had a lot of attitude about it. And with this, I mean, this reeks of all the different kinds of sex in the book and all the different kinds of bodies and sensation. Are, are, I mean, I think the book in many ways is a lot about travel, but I think the travel, yes. the transness of travel in bodies and, and the capacity of the writer to either imagine or appropriate, appropriate those bodies. And, and this is just, you know, and I think, I mean, again, Cullum in the introduction said something about, it was like, a, um, what did he say about a kitty? Um, and imagine, you were drawing from an imagined kitty. <laughs> Um, of, of, of sensations and, and, and it just seems so beautifully accurate. But I want to I jump on a word that you use yourself um, it, that it both appears in the introduction and which is um, impure. And I think the essence and the problematics, which is not my favorite word, but I think it just works here. Um, the problematics of this book is impurity on so many levels. Um, and if you want to say anything, I mean, I have lots of questions specifically about that, but if you want to say anything about that word, you have a beautiful quote about yourself as a writer in terms of the impure. Well, I wonder what it is. <laughs> I mean, I can read it to you, but yeah. Um, well, let me say that I, so as I was beginning to sort of think about how to, how to make this novel happen, make this work happen, uh, I, I had a temptation, and my temptation was to not include me in the book. Uh -huh. And in my mind, that would have made it a pure book. And uh, so that I was balancing this, I, this really, this deep temptation to make this object more beautiful than it is by not including myself. Could I ask with, you, I, can I interrupt okay. you a bit right there? Can I'm I just sorry? ask you? Can I just ask you right there, why, why would including yourself make it a pure book? No, no, not including myself would make oh, it a okay. pure book. Oh, okay, great, sorry. And so, and then my model was Flaubert in his historical uh, works, like St. Julian, for example, um, uh, where there's this just perfect sense of a capsule, something is, delivered that doesn't have any loose ends. It's just delivered as a piece of perfection. And uh, as opposed to having the very messy uh, story of Bob and Elle and, the, and to demonstrate the projection that was happening of my story into, into Marjorie's and to actually bring that into the book. And usually when I have a problem, uh, for me, the solution of that problem is bringing it into the book. Mm -hmm. It's not solving the problem, it's, it's articulating the problem. And so the, in the end, that's what I decided, that it would be a better book for me to articulate that problem mm -hmm. rather than just to make this kind of sphere 
that is uh, that's, uh, sufficient unto itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now it's open and it can never be closed. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know, you could never, you can never stitch it up. It will right. never be coherent. Mm -hmm. Um, the the word the word Bob. I mean, I I read the book and then I thought I think the word Bob never occurred. Is that true? No, it does. It does. It does. Yeah. Oh, okay. Bob yeah, the Boronist. I, L says. Yes. 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 Because <laughs> I am used to I am used to your character your your the character Bob being in your being your yes. books. So I think okay the the blatantly impure is the sex with Jesus. That's yes, yes. I guess which that's is <laughs> kind of amazing. Like the the Bob is is finger fucking Jesus. I mean, it was just like my Catholic upbringing. I mean, it was it was weird. I wasn't aghast, but I was. It 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 was like it added. It was kind of the shock of it added a kind of a. It was almost like after doing yoga, you just had this extra air. And the the simple fact of the fact that we're not supposed to see somebody we're not supposed to see somebody fucking Jesus um, just added this kind of um, oomph to every single one of those performances. It was astonishing, and and it was a question of who what was 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 that taking the shock away from the intimacy of the. I mean, it was like you know the book destabilizes as you're saying it destabilizes itself constantly, and it almost yeah. seemed like the. The shock of was it consciously the sex with Jesus would take away from the shock of the blatant sex with your former lover? Um, no, I'm not sure I was balancing them in that way. It was my hope that uh, that people could see my parts of the my parts of the Jesus story as opposed to Marjorie's. Mm -hmm. And so the overlap between the two stories, which actually gets more and more intense as the book goes on, um, they start appearing in the same sections and so on, Elle and Jesus and Marjorie and Bob. Um, I guess it was my, I mean, I, I, of course I wanted to make startling moments happen. Uh, I'm not sure how to answer that. I, I, I guess, I hope that people will register the tone, the changes in tone, and know, you know, how to ascribe them, like right. which, which plot, which storyline to it, even when they start getting confused. Right, right. But again, sometimes because we don't know, that's exactly what what is so great about yes, the construction yeah. of the book. Maybe my old, boy, my old Catholic boyfriend said he, when he was reading the book, he would look up to see if anybody was watching him. He felt so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to ask you more about the the um, the writing about the the contemporary recent contemporary lover, but um, but I think this might be a great moment for you to read something. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Would you read something for, for us from the book? Sure, sure. Um, let's see. I think I'll read. Uh, okay, here's Marjorie. Um, Here's Marjorie praying in a side chapel of St. Margaret's in, in Bishop's Lynn, where she lived. Jesus, when I feel the difference between my stale life and the ecstasy of life with you, I revive the desolation I felt before meeting you in order to coax your appearance. I been, begin crying so intently, my voice sounds hoarse and strange. My face is rigid, my arms and legs are weak, and civilization grows tender and sensitive to pain. There is a bleeding in my chest, a sixth sense, the continuous awareness of your body. I enlarge myself by equating your tenderness towards me with the pain of your death. My jaws lock open and tears and mucus pull off my face. 
I'm on my stomach in a side chapel at St. Margaret's. My hip bones press against the floor. Gas moves through the side of my gut. My hot cheek grinds on the stone. My crying is choked. I curl into a ball and clench in impossible shape. I put myself in your body. Its frequency is so high, it heaves upwards. You need me as you did at first. Into our most intense union, the opposite feeling enters. Disorder, the strangeness of what's happening to me. Tears don't stop, but convulsions do. The more I need you, the deeper the estrangement, the stronger my desire, a defect in the movement of love. I'm so tired of being alone. I swim through my tears to the back of my head to observe this. My crying regular is a swimmer's breath. That retreat allows ghosts to enter. You stumble towards me as a rickety man, one leg keeps caving in. You say with complete understanding, if it weren't for my body, I could go on forever. We fall into each other's arms and as we grieve, I rejoice a welling feeling of life which now even pain stimulates. I become aroused as the flat sweet odor makes my gorge rise. I promise that I will save you, your eyes darken, your face rolls away, the stench of decay spreads. As I make the pledge, your tongue is stiff as the metal clapper of a bell, purple brown, like burnt iron, everything wasted. I witness my anguish with excitement. Who would reject more life? In my bleak, monotonous weeping, I wonder at the very terms of suffering's argument. That you are, my love is, you die, flesh is. A baffling confirmation. It's not pain or joy until wept out as fiery tears. That outburst causes a tooth of pleasure to bite hard. Currents travel through me to the distance. When I finish crying, I'm empty, exalted, withdraw my tears, and I do not enjoy food, drink, or talk. There is no flavor till I weep again. A little more? Or? Um, I say a little more, please. Yeah? I say a little okay, more. Okay, this, so just to give you a feeling of it, this follows right after. A moonless night, the snow frozen over, so our footsteps crunch. A fifth of B&B &B stands in my pocket. The waterfall doesn't make a sound, a huge sheet of mid-flight ice. Elle's flashlight beam finds an oval that melted or never froze, and through that hole, we see a black torrent endlessly spill. Elle's voice says, it's frightening. Why is that, I wonder? We share a flask, a mouthful of potent, fumy syrup. I lean out of the light against a trunk sluggish with the desire to be kissed. Cold lips, fiery tongue, brandy, his fragile heat is dull fear embedded in deep winter. Too bad life isn't a cafeteria. Pay first, eat without dreading the bill. No, he answers, the cost is so appalling you couldn't stand the food. I'm impressed by his bitterness, a moment of harmony between us. The bean picks out a hole which conveys the beckoning vitality, the rictus of a corpse announcing that the present is dead. Let's see. Maybe I'll read a passage that describes Marjorie is traveling over the Alps with her guide, William. And this gives you a sense of some part of the book that goes just in snapshots of declarative sentences. It was mid-February. William wound his tippet round his neck and sheltered his hands in his armpits. His empty sleeves swung woodenly. Larch and fur grew beneath snowy peaks. The travelers were flushed with expanding harmonies of wind, space, drizzle, clouds, and thick greens. Her words were lost in the wind. Snipes zigzag crying, chipur, chipur. The road skirted the steepest rocks and in places was hewn out of them. Marjorie climbed with amazing stamina. William smiled and wheezed. The bottom of his right foot was so sore he cringed when he stepped. They ate boar sausage and stuffed gooseneck. She was traveling. Every bowel movement was a triumph. Water mills turned above foaming rivers. 
they climbed up to Rizia and over the pass. Snow lay thick and abundant, masked on branches, glittering wealth that could not be acquired. Wolves had crossed, leaving delicate prints. Stars swarmed upwards, then the moon held the white peaks in a trance. Pale mountains grew smaller in the radiant sunrise. Melting snow water coursed downhill in reels that wagon wheels pressed in the mud. The foothills were covered by sloping vineyards and dotted by whitewashed houses. Almond trees bloomed palest pink. Cowards tended white cattle splattered with black spots and gave the travelers food and drink. Their wives put Marjorie in their own beds. A horse was hag ridden. Its owners filled a bottle with its urine, stopped it with a cork and buried it. The witch could not piss and died in agony. The air hummed with flies when the travelers approached the cattle, rich odors of dung and hay. They heard oozles ringing, chew, chew, chew. The peasants clupped their ears. Farmers tilled their small field to the limit. Women carded and combed, clouded and washed, and peeled rushes, as in Lynn. One woman became a man when he jumped over an irrigation ditch and his cunt dropped inside out. Gender is the extent we go to in order to be loved. His mittens were made of rags. Pasture sloped down to rich valley divided into square farms, fields of rye grass for winter forage, and silvery olive orchards where blue tit sang tsi tsi tsu hu hu hu. In Belzana, women traded in silk and leather in the square, discussed Marjorie and William as they arrived. Later, Marjorie woke, feeling her heart skip a beat, another, another, as though it fell downstairs. And she, laughing in surprise, scrambled after it. So, let's see. Should I read a more? Um, let's see. Were you going to say sex? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, one sex piece, and then we'll, yeah, and then I have a couple more questions, and then people want to ask you questions, but that last piece was amazing. I mean, they're all, it's all great. You're just starting to be in the read, and you, I feel like you could read yeah. for days now, and it's really exciting. L, as Jesus, lounges on his side and unbuttons the fly of his gray rayon slacks. He fishes out his cock and balls and drapes them across his thigh to the mattress so their exposure isolates their pendulousness. His lips snaggled on a tooth duplicates the shape of his cock's ragged mouth. A pale band of skin between his shirt and trousers was dented by the elastic of his boxer shorts. He's controlling his breath, infinitely passive. He's subject himself to the clamor his body makes. He pushes my hand away. Although I travel, I'm deflected from my goal. I never encountered nakedness that was not also an invitation. My heart beats with useless excitement. He struggles to understand a rage inside himself. Is my love amazing because it exists? Does it verify my existence? Or are my tears merely the faulty plumbing of a hysteric? Elscock testifies to the human form he chose, so strange to him that he will not let me touch it as though keeping co-conspirators from meeting. Just a little. That's so great. Um, I mean, there's two, there's two things, there's two things I want to ask about. And um, I, I, but I have to, the, the first one I have to, the birds, uh, one of my, the, one of the most amazing, because the book is, has these two parts and you're putting it together or these mini parts. And it's such a, um, pastiche it's clear that you've done so much research like that last you know it's we're in the medieval era with you and it seems to me that the 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 sonic thing that keeps hitting the present almost more than anything is the sound of birds oh yes yeah each time an italicized sound kater kater happens so what's your real i mean i know you're a maker and i think and you are a maker of you know fictions and pastiche and it, but these micro moments make me think about, well, just tell me, tell me about birds. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, just to say of the various things in this book that are accurate, 
the birds are always where they're supposed to be. Even, <laughs> even in December or like the, you know, when Jesus was born in the Holy Land, the birds that are in Marjorie's visions are the birds that would be there. These birds wow. travel a lot. And uh, of the various things, now I had to select things that I wanted to be perfectly accurate about. Uh, clothing, food, uh, and, you know, a few gestures. I did a lot of, like, trying to figure out uh, what medieval gestures were like, late medieval gestures. Um, but, the, yes, I wanted, uh, there, were, there are a couple of things that kind of hold the whole book together, and the sound of birds is one. Well, you know, like Messian, the sound of angels. Uh, so there's this bird angel thing. And uh, oh yeah, mostly that. I wanted there to be kind of this celestial language uh, going all the way through. There, there are a few words that go all the way through that are repeated again and again. Exalt, abandon, amaze, um, exasperate. Uh, and, so, and that those happen again and again and again. If you listen for them, they're practically on every page. Um, yeah, it's sort of, it's, it's the, the birds feel like micro sampling, you know, and they kind of remind you of, they make me think of, of the practice throughout that in these moments, you can't miss it. The, the, the one final question I want to ask before we turn to other people is, so in the case of L, and these are such, um, naked and beautiful and sensual and hot descriptions of, of the literal lovemaking and the agonies of a relationship um and i wonder um what was your what was your process with showing the actual pr i mean how did you deal with the person who you were modeling it on how how did you negotiate that yeah really uh, this reading now 25 years later i thought oh my god imagine being given this book imagine being <laughs> Um, and I had, a, yeah, a wash of alarm uh, about 25 years later. Um, I, did, uh, I did show Elle the book before it was published, as I do whenever I include people uh, who could be recognized. Um, and uh, he was, of course, he was pretty surprised. Um, but he also had complaints, which I listened to. Uh, and which I do uh, always uh, when I'm writing about someone. And he said, not this way, but this way. And why don't you include uh, more, the, more of the pleasure of our relationship? Because at that point when I showed it to him, it was just furious. And I did go back into it and made it a better book. Uh, and, it, and it does when I show, because obviously I write about people that I know and when I show them the, the work and they, their grievances and also the things that they feel I left out, uh, always uh, make the book better. So, um, yeah, I think a recent review uh, outed him. You, you think, say it again? Well, I, I know, a recent review sort of identified him. Oh, wow, oh, that's, that is so, 21st century. Yes, right? I thought so. <laughs> right, and why not give his address too, right? Um, I, let me that, see what that answer, Does that answer your question? I know, I think it, it does, it does. Um, I, this is not a question, but the incantation throughout the book, it's so funny, it's like, Jesus, did you miss me? Oh, uh, yes, Jesus, Mark, where will I get the money? <laughs> um, I would, maybe I should also add that we have been dear friends for our whole lives. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, we did get through that period and, uh, and we're very, I mean, dear friends with each other. Yeah. We've done other, we've done projects together. No, the love, the love is, the love is clear. Um, it, and this is just a silly, I mean, I, have you, it would make such a sensational, and I didn't think this when I read it 20 years ago, it would make a sensational movie, this book. It would well, be you know, the, glorious. The filmmaker, John Grayson, uh, bought it 
bought the oh, rights, really? but he couldn't find the funding for it, uh, unsurprisingly, I guess. Um, but I always thought so. Uh, I, I, um, yeah, that would be fun. It's already I fantasize about it. Getting a phone call from you know whoever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's fantastic casting, but I can't. A younger Chris Krause would be such a great Marjorie. <laughs> you know? I just thought this is the fanatic that could play her so perfectly. Yeah. Um, well, you know. Uh, I had to make these people look like somebody, and Marjorie basically was modeled on Susan Sarandon. Oh, wow. Um, because I needed a woman who was both, had, well, a look of that period, which she does, but huh. also who was intelligent and, and sensual. And that's, Susan Sarandon seemed right to me. That's so great, that's so great. But that's when you first, she's probably aged out of the role, right? I, I'm afraid so. I don't know. We need a young Susan Sarandon. <laughs> so let me let me look at the chat and see what people have got. I think we've got some great questions. Um, okay. Um, oh, here's a great. Okay, this is a beautiful book. One question I have is about the use of Old English in the book, which struck me as a sort of penetration of another kind. As I read the quotes from Marjorie, I didn't feel taken out of your text so much as I felt the late Middle Ages breaking through. Can you say something about the layering of language? That's pretty good. Ah, uh, what a nice question. And yeah, it really answers itself um, because that's exactly right. I wanted to use, I used them as pins, like, like safety pins or bo bobby pins. What are the pins? Thumbtacks as thumbtacks to hold down a sentence or a passage uh, by, you know, well, the effect of the real, I suppose, by giving it a date or something like that, but bringing Marjorie's language into it. Marjorie wrote in Middle English, one could still read it, and the sound of that sentence is, the sound of my sentence in, the, in that book is really a collaboration between the sound of her sentence and whatever I could come up with. So that just the very, the way the senses work and the, and the, and the way they land in some way is partly Marjorie's Middle English, which has, I don't know, uh, I can't quote Marjorie, but I could quote some Middle English and you would see, should I do that? Uh, Go ahead, yeah. Oh, well, let's see. This is from Troilus and Cressida uh, by Chaucer, his favorite writer of mine. And it describes a nightingale coming in, singing to her and putting her to sleep. She goes into a dream and an eagle comes and exchanges hearts with her. Okay, so, a nightingale upon a satyr grena, under the chambre wall there as she lay, full loudest song, I in the moon ashamed. Paranter in his birdless wise, a lay of love that made her heart the fresh and gay, that hearkened she so long in good intent to laugh the last the dead asleep her henta. And as she slept, an unrecto her meta, how that an eagle feathered wit his bond upon her breath, breast his longer claws set her, and made her heart into his breast to gone, of which she not to gruse, nor nothing smert and forth he flies with Hertha left for Hertha. So that's the kind of the rhythm of that, that uh, Middle English, it's so beautiful. Wow, it sounds almost more Scandinavian than Germanic. Yes. Incredible. Um, there's more questions here. And guys, keep the questions coming because I think I've got a few, but we could, we could hear some more. Um, let's see. Okay. So this is a really gorgeous sentence about gender as the extent we go to and like where it comes up or drops as it were. Is that exactly, does that make sense to you, Bob? Um, let me keep reading. Can you say something about why there? I always read it as an exit, read love as an exit here. I don't know, it just floors me how that passage happens. Can you, does that make sense to you, Bob? Can I read it again? Uh... 
Well, maybe you should. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, I, can, I can talk about that passage, but. Yeah, uh, it's like, so it begins like this. So this really gorgeous sentence about gender as, as the extent, yeah, this is quoting you now, as the yes. extent we go to. In order to be loved. Yeah, yeah. Can you say something about why there? But I think, you know, obviously answer it, however. Uh -huh. um, why I always actually, or? Go ahead. Uh, I think it comes from a story, I think Pas in Pascal, there's a, this story um, that he describes, actually. I think it comes from Pascal, I think. Uh, really, that's just my, it comes out of my, the experience when you're so goofily uh, in love, everything is, your, your body is, there's this kind of estrangement that takes place. Like, why do I look like this? Why does that person look like this? Why does anybody look like this? If you think about it, this estrangement that happens, which is the other side of an obsession, but goes along with it, uh, you're moved to wonder. It's really a question about form. Like, how on earth did we get this way? And, and uh, form does not seem immutable at all. It seems in, in, in constant commotion and flux. And so that was sort of, that describes uh, the state I was in, based, I mean, in the first place, besides just being an observation about how odd it is, how odd gender is in the, you know, our, how odd our bodies are. Like, how did we get like this? Why are we this way? That's the moment I think you were, the character was leaping over a ditch. She jumping over a ditch. This was, uh, this was seen as a danger uh, in that time period that women were advised not to do that for- To jump, of, not, to, not to jump over ditches? Yes, not to jump. Uh, and not to do things too strenuous because that was seen as a possible danger because men and women's anatomies in that ah, era right, were right. viewed as just uh, uh, the opposites of each other that, that were uh, much more than later. I mean, right, later, right. I mean, at least in this era, they had an idea about women's anatomy that would disappear right. for a few centuries. <laughs> right, and, right, right. And, you know, until later on when they did, did in the in the late 18th century when they started doing dissections, but uh, in this period the, that that was the view that there was a danger that one's cunt could actually drop out and become a penis. Well, I'm not hearing you. Especially going over a ditch, which is so cunt-like. Yes. <laughs> um, Okay, I've got a question here, an urgent one. Let's see um, where it's, whoa. Oh, Mr. Gluck, I am writing on the book of Marjorie Kemp now, and I wanna know who introduced it to you. As both a reader and a writer, what do you appreciate about the language of the original Middle English book? Ah, uh, um, I learned it about it in college and as an undergraduate in a medieval literature class. I got just a chapter of her book, and then I went out and found out more about her, and and um, and uh, she went through her book went through different eras. Um, it was lost until the 1930s. All that was there were a few a few uh, poems, a few prayers that were very lyrical and people expected kind of a big thing uh, 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 from her work uh, if they could find it. They expected like another Julian of Norwich, like this a great, uh, 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 um, amazing mystic. And then uh, somebody named Butler Bowden discovered it in a, in a manor library in the 19, late 20s of 1920s. And when he published it, his preface was poor Marjorie because she was so disappointing on the level of piety and, um, uh, well, and, and language because her language is not the exalted language of Julian and other, uh, other mystics. 
St. Catherine. Uh, and so then the feminist took her up as an amazingly strong woman, which she was, uh, and also a woman who would confront anybody. She enjoyed it, she, confronting bishops. And even her life was in danger. And even so, she would do that. And that way, we're not alike at all. And, uh, and then the kind of the maw of cultural studies took her up and absorbed her uh, as uh, a person who wrote about everyday life. So that's sort of the history of her book. The, for me, the language, the tremendous energy uh, uh, is, re is really what you take away, that she was just unstoppable. She's very self-aggrandizing. In some ways, it's like the little me of the 15th century, you know? It's like uh, everything she says about herself to make herself seem grander uh, seems somewhat tawdry. She does a lot of very mean-spirited miracles, like telling people when they're going to die. And of course, she writes the book long after they died, so there's no, there's no way <laughs> to, to check. <laughs> um, well, but it's the, it's the sheer energy, uh, uh, her sheer energy, she was unstoppable, and she, and she set people's teeth on edge. And that's in the writing, that's in, in her prose. It just goes, it just unrelenting. I don't know, does that answer a question? <laughs> yeah, I think that does. And I have two questions, questions that are pretty specifically around sex. And I think ah. those might be the, the most we can get to. Let's see, hold on. No, I'm not hearing you. Okay, you hear ah. me now, right? Yes. Okay, one is from Allie Warren who says, hi, Bob. Hi. Um, this is a weird, like, writing question. This book is such an amazing study of erotic obsession, and I wonder how much time you needed, if any, between the time of being obsessed and the time of making the study. Hi, Bob. Hi. <laughs> well, it's not quite, it works in the other direction, which is that I started writing Soon after we broke up, I started assembling materials. And then, and then I was the one sort of stuck with this relationship for five years as I was going over and over and over it, um, uh, as opposed to moving on. Uh, you know, you, I had to be in it for, for, well, I think it was about five years, four or five years. Um, and when you're, when you're writing about, uh, about your own love life, you start off as writing as the person who's in the right, and then, but you finish writing as the person who's in the wrong. <laughs> and that's what that amount of focus on it leads you to. <laughs> that's, that's great. Um, this, okay, this other one is, let's see. Okay, I'm still hearable. Um, where is it? Thank you so much for giving this reading. It's such a beautiful book. I also have a short question about the descriptions of sex in the book. I was struck by how lush the language was for both the sex between Jesus and Marjorie and Bob and Elle. As a woman reader, I thought the entire book was really, really hot. Could you please speak more about your process when writing sex, not just quotes? about sex, aside from asking your friends and borrowing from pornography? Uh, well, I made it my, uh, uh, could say it was, it would be a kind of new narrative project to pay attention to the body. For me, it's not just sex, it's the body, which makes a kind of language. Uh, and these, uh, I don't know, like Kathy Acker and I used to exchange these kinds of nuggets. You know, we would learn some detail some about sex and we'd pass it to the other or just jump on it in our conversations because it was like a language. And, and sensory life is really uh, the hardest thing to describe, of course. If I wanted to give my students an impossible assignment, I would ask them to describe eating an apple. Um, 
So it's hard, it's a just, a, it's always been like this undiscovered country um, that, but that where language had yet to be invented. That's how, certainly that's how we felt about it uh, in the 70s uh, and that's in the 80s, 90s and so on. Uh, it was, it was a, like being an explorer uh, with that kind of excitement because these things hadn't been written down, not in this way at any rate. So it was, yeah, there was a feeling of exploration. No, not hearing. Yes, I think we have a couple of minutes. So we ah. have at least one more question. We have two minutes. Um, whoa. Well, uh, okay, here's some, well, there's two, hmm. <laughs> this is funny. Everyone here is going to horny jail. I don't know. <laughs> you know what that is? You understand that? No. <laughs> no, but it's great. Okay, here's the question. How, I'm wondering how one can be disappointing in piety. What do you mean by Kemp being disappointing in piety? Ah, well, there are many examples in the late Middle Ages of these women writers, especially women, but you know, also the Cloud of Annoying and other texts that were very, written very beautifully in very august ways, that were very convincing in terms of their of their um, uh, of their relation to God. Marjorie's is another story. It's, she wanted to be a saint, but she did not do the saint things. And by that, I mean, her does, she, she, that was a goal. You can't have a goal of being a saint. That's not one of the things you, that makes a saint. Your goal is helping people, performing, you know, works of, contrition of, of healing or whatever, but your goal can't really be self-promotion. And so Marjorie was kind of, I mean, one, what drew me to Marjorie is that she was using a kind of middle-class goal orientation, that, and by that I mean modern goal orientation, to achieve a kind of medieval end, uh, or an end that could not possibly be achieved through a middle-class goal orientation any, at any rate. So that, uh, that's what I mean by her piety being disappointing. It was too self-promoting. She's very self-promoting in the book. Uh, she's bragging, she's, she's uh, talking about uh, besting everyone, she's, she's in conflict with everyone, she wins every argument, she, you know, there are many, many proofs, miracles that she, you know, she, she describes. And that's not how St. Julian of Norwich was, in, you know, uh, had a religious moment, meditated on it for 20 years, then carefully wrote a book about it in which she doesn't, she just describes these things that happened to her. She doesn't make any claims. So that's, the, that's how Marjorie is seen as her piety is disappointing. Great. I think now we, I think we're kind well, I think we're at the end. Is, is John with us? Because one person has said something which is completely untrue, but I want to say it out loud. <laughs> yeah, is it that? Is, yeah. We're done. <laughs> no, but what was the one thing? Okay. Yeah. It's sort of, okay, hold on. It's, um, <laughs> It seems as if Bob grew up believing people didn't have sex in the Middle Ages. Is this true? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. That? Arundel has glasses. The the uh, 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 a uh, a bishop who liked to uh, uh, murder heretics. I, I describe Arundel as having thick thick glasses. In fact. <laughs> Just <laughs> uh, should I give more sent more people to the eye doctor? <laughs> <laughs>
Now, I actually, I'm having a disconnect. Did that, that was about eyeglasses as opposed to sex in the Middle Ages? Oh, I thought you said spectacles. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. The question was, that's really funny. Okay, I was like, do I just struggle? You know, it's, Bob grew up believing people didn't have sex in the Middle Ages. Is this true? No, no, not at all. How could that, how could I think that? There, no. Since there were people who came after people in the Middle Ages. But uh, there's plenty of body writing in the Middle Ages, Chaucer for one. There's, there's plenty of body stories. Uh, so, yeah. No, yeah, That's so lots. no way. Yeah. <laughs> lots. Yeah. Well, I think we're there. This has been really oh, fun. This was Thank a lot of so fun. Much. We wanted to host this originally, I think, back closer to when the book came out in March at our in printing March, yes. And I'm so glad that we could still do it this way. Um, thank you, Eileen, for moderating. Thank you, Bob, thank for the you. gift of your book. And thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. I hope you all had a good time. I hope you'll buy the book from us. We have a big stack of this handsome new edition of this really wonderful book. Um, but thank you all. Thank you. Have a wonderful Bye. night. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Ciao, ciao, ciao. There are 66 <laughs> chapters. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs>